Good afternoon on today's Angry Bulletin. Although the DART mission can definitely be called an unqualified success at this point, researchers are still concerned that we are not going to be able to deploy something like the DART quickly enough to a target, especially to a target that gets detected at the last moment. However, there's a better way to deploy the DART that consumes a lot less fuel and delivers a much bigger punch to the asteroid in question. No, I'm not talking about nukes. I'm talking about space stations, specifically space stations in orbit around the moon. All of this and more coming at you on The Angry Astronaut right now. Good afternoon, and once again, welcome to The Angry Astronaut. So, a lot of us have heard things about Artemis and NASA's plans to build a space station in lunar orbit. And many space policy experts have argued that this is just a bad idea, that Moon Direct is the best way for us to get back to the moon and to get there to stay. Building a space station as an intermediary point between the Earth and the moon is just a pointless waste. And now that Starship has been selected as NASA's human landing system of choice and is going to be the primary way that we land human beings, cargo, or anything else on the moon, why do we really need a tiny space station orbiting the moon? We could just put a starship in orbit around the moon if we really needed a permanent presence in lunar orbit. Why do we require an expensive, complicated, and very small space station instead? Well, even though the Lunar Gateway would have been much better suited to a smaller landing system, something like the Alpaca, and really when it comes down to it, when the Lunar Gateway was conceptualized, certainly nobody thought that the HLS was going to be a massive ship with a fairing over a thousand cubic meters in size, the Lunar Gateway still serves an extremely important purpose. As a matter of fact, for the last few years, the European Space Agency has been researching the possibility of the Lunar Gateway acting as a defensive space station to monitor and perhaps even deflect incoming asteroids. But how is this possible? How could the Lunar Gateway deflect dangerous asteroids any better than something launched from Earth? What really is the purpose? Well, as you're going to find out, the Lunar Gateway is actually six times as efficient at deflecting asteroids than anything launched from Earth. And of course, the main reason for that is gravity. First of all, I would like to thank Ramon Glazer, my latest Patreon supporter. Thank you so much. Actually, my 10th new Patreon supporter this December. That's really fantastic. It really helps this channel, especially in my ability to cover these things in person in the United States, Europe, and elsewhere. So what you're looking at right now is the power and propulsion element from Maxar. Maxar was contracted years ago, actually, to build the propulsion system for the Lunar Gateway. Power and propulsion element, also known as the PPE, is actually one of the first features that makes the Lunar Gateway better than a lunar starship for an orbital station around the moon. The reason is, this is an ion engine, actually the largest ion engine that's ever been built. It ionizes xenon gas, utilizing electricity gathered by 60 kilowatt solar panels, and then passes that ionized xenon gas through a magnetic field, and then blasts the ionized plasma through a rocket nozzle and away from the spacecraft at a speed of about 20 kilometers per second, or quadruple the speed of propellant from a chemical engine. Now, of course, you don't get a tremendous amount of thrust out of these kinds of engines, but the ISP is 
absolutely tremendous. We're talking at least 2,000 seconds as opposed to just over 400 for the best chemical engines, meaning that for the relatively minor maneuvering that this space station is going to have to undertake over its 15-year history, well, it's going to have more than enough propellant to handle that without refueling, whereas a Starship utilizing Raptor engines is going to run out of propellant pretty quickly. So it would require its own ion engines if it was to be a space station, and they'd have to be really powerful ion engines to move a hundred metric tons worth of stainless steel, plus whatever payload it had on board. But in order for a lunar space station to effectively support any ground facilities that may be in place, especially at the lunar south pole, you're going to need to have the station in plain sight of the lunar south pole most of the time. And how are you supposed to do that? Well, the orbit is key, and that is one of the reasons why NASA decided on the near rectilinear halo orbit, as it is called. Unlike the Apollo lunar orbits, this particular orbit hangs kind of like a necklace around the moon, passing very close to the moon at one point, but very far away at the other end of the orbit. Why does it do this? Because of stability. The low lunar orbits that Apollo used could only keep the capsule in orbit for a few days before the orbit would start to decay, meaning that you need to use propellant constantly in order to keep the spacecraft or space station in orbit similar to the ISS. However, with this near rectilinear halo orbit, it's extremely stable. You need very little propellant in order to remain in this orbit, and at the same time, it provides easy access to the lunar surface, and it keeps the lunar south pole in almost constant visual and radio contact with the space station. The moon's south pole only passes into a dark zone with this orbit for four hours out of every week. Four hours out of every week. Otherwise, the station can communicate with the South Pole and also keep an eye on what's going on down there in the event that a hostile nation also establishes a presence at the Lunar South Pole. In addition to that, it is very easy to enter this orbit or to leave it, meaning that if the Lunar Starship is on its way to dock with the Lunar Gateway or even with the Orion, this particular orbit is is a very easy orbit for it to enter for an easy docking procedure. Not very much fuel is needed once you're firmly established in this orbit. This is a big advantage for the Lunar Gateway. It provides a stable and constant platform for deploying landing vehicles to the lunar surface or controlling robotic devices on the lunar surface like rovers or perhaps machinery designed to assemble habitats. Keep in mind, you have constant radio contact only going into a dark zone four hours out of every week, meaning that you could continue control various types of rovers or machinery in real time on the lunar surface without having to send astronauts down there or without having to control the machinery from Earth. There are many, many uses to this space station. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention that this can also be used as a quarantine laboratory for any samples that might be arriving from elsewhere in the solar system. Indeed, many scientists are advocating that the Lunar Gateway be used as a quarantine facility for the upcoming Mars Sample Return mission, assuming it actually gets started. So as you can see here, you have the power and propulsion element, you have something called the halo, which is the initial habitat that two astronauts will be using during the early stages of Artemis missions. That will be followed by a module called the IHAB, which will add additional habitat space, albeit not very much because these modules are designed to be carried inside the fairing of a Falcon Heavy. NASA has admitted that they're not going to be able to use SLS to carry these modules, nor can they rely on Starship yet, not until they know that that the refueling architecture for Starship is going to be effective, meaning that the habitable space on this station is going to be tiny to start off with. 
However, in the long run, it can get a lot bigger very easily. A single inflatable module from Sierra Space deployed on a Vulcan Centaur could add another 300 cubic meters worth of space to this station, which would be more than enough for the relatively small crews that are going to be staying on it for astronauts at maximum at least until the 2040s. However, what about asteroid defense? I mean, we've talked about a lot of the other advantages that this station presents, but that's the sort of thing NASA has talked about many times. How is ESA planning on deflecting asteroids with this thing? Well, here's the advantage of the Lunar Gateway and specifically its halo orbit. Anything placed into this orbit is more than likely going to stay there. This includes kinetic deflectors used to stop asteroids. If you're launching an interceptor spacecraft, especially one with a substantially large spacecraft on board or a nuclear warhead, you have to achieve at least 11.2 kilometers per second in order to escape Earth's gravity and intercept an asteroid far enough away to make a difference. Whereas if it's orbiting the moon, it only needs to accelerate to 2.42 kilometers per second. It takes less than 5% of the energy to place a spacecraft from the moon on a heliocentric orbit compared to placing the same spacecraft from the Earth into a heliocentric orbit, meaning that actually you have 20 times the efficiency for any interceptor being launched from the Lunar Gateway's halo orbit, or for any interceptor being controlled by the Gateway for that matter because it could serve that purpose as well. The Gateway's halo orbit gives it a very good view of all the surrounding space in the vicinity of Earth, meaning that it can spot near-Earth objects approaching far more efficiently and reliably than any Earth-bound observation platform. Any observatory or any collection of observatories cannot begin to compete with a space station in lunar orbit, especially the orbit that the Gateway will be occupying. And there are other advantages as well. For one thing, if you want to deploy an interceptor to stop an incoming asteroid that you've only just detected and you don't have a hell of a lot of time to prepare, well, you're in serious trouble if you're trying to do it from Earth. Rockets take a substantial amount of time to prepare, to fuel up, to get the payload integrated into the fairing. All of these things could take precious days, weeks, or perhaps even months while the asteroid is approaching on its collision course. Whereas, if you had interceptors with ion engines similar to the PPE traveling either with the gateway or perhaps even mounted on the gateway itself, well, these could be deployed very quickly and very easily towards any incoming asteroid. Now, of course, this this is not only for asteroid defense. Spacecraft mounted on the gateway could also be used to explore cislunar space or various parts of the lunar surface with unmanned missions utilizing minimal amounts of fuel in the process. The fuel could even be manufactured in situ on the lunar surface and delivered to the gateway to be used by various spacecraft over and over again, utilizing much, much less propellant than it would take to deliver the same fuel from the Earth. What you're looking at right now is the European Large Logistics Lander, which is designed to retrieve samples from the lunar surface, deliver it to the lander, which has an ascent stage, which then goes to the lunar gateway. Now, in the future, a more reusable version of this lander could take the entire thing back up to the lunar gateway, refuel, and then deploy again on the lunar surface, or perhaps more importantly, resupply astronauts on the lunar surface as well. In case you've forgotten, SpaceX has been contracted to resupply the Lunar Gateway using a modified Crew Dragon known as the Dragon XL. This cargo-only lunar spacecraft will deliver supplies 
to the gateway, not to the lunar surface. It requires a lot less fuel to do that, and it's pretty easy to do it also because of the gateway's unique orbit. Once those supplies are delivered to the gateway, they can then be transported down to the lunar surface, again using a minimal amount of fuel, fuel that can be provided in situ from the moon itself. And also, in the future, Blue Origin, theoretically anyway, is going to be providing something called the Blue Moon Lander, which is going to primarily be taking supplies, equipment, habitats, etc. down to the lunar surface. It runs off of hydrogen and oxygen, things that are going to be plentiful at least at the lunar south pole. Once again, this is something that could ferry supplies and equipment to and from the lunar gateway with a minimal amount of fuel. So here's the bottom line. The Lunar Gateway is a crucial part of the infrastructure that Artemis is going to depend on. It provides continuous communication and support with astronauts on the surface. It can provide a permanently inhabited station orbiting the moon at all times, whereas that's something that's going to be a lot more difficult to do on the moon, at least for a while. And most importantly, it can provide protection for our planet not only from asteroids, but also from potentially dangerous diseases, providing a valuable quarantine lab completely isolated from our planet to make sure that nothing dangerous from our solar system creates a catastrophe on Earth. Oh yeah, one other detail as far as asteroids are concerned that I forgot to mention. You can possibly bring up radioactives from the moon as well radioactives that could be used to build a nuclear device if needed to stop a very big asteroid. That bomb can provide a nuclear punch to a target in the solar system with a hell of a lot less fuel than any nuclear device you might build on Earth. And it's a lot safer too because you're building it in lunar orbit rather than trying to launch it from Earth or an anomaly could create a second catastrophe. I hope I have given you enough details in this video to demonstrate why the Lunar Gateway is such a good idea. Given the, all of the problems, all of the flaws and weaknesses that exist in the Artemis plan, this, in my opinion, is its strongest feature. A feature that could serve the human race for decades to come. Thank you very much for watching. Please like, please subscribe. It's very important to the success of my channel. And as always, stay angry about space.